There we go. Okay. Um, I know we talked about common sense um, and that it's the pamphlet that uh, was produced by Thomas Paine in an effort to um, kind of bring the public opinion into declaring independence, right? Trying, it's a propaganda issue. And they, he used this, all of the profits that he made from this pamphlet to fund the uh, war effort, right? To fund the Continental Army. Um, so did we, we got to the Declaration of Independence, correct? Yes, no? No, I don't think so, we didn't. Okay. All right. So, um, timeline wise, let's, let's look at that too. Um, we've had Lexington and Concord, right? That's occurred. And, um, at this point, the Continental Congress convenes again, because, um, you know, this obviously changes the situation that we had these two battles in which Americans were killed by British troops. There's open armed rebellion. And so they meet again in Philadelphia and they come up with um, two, they really have a couple of main objectives. Their first main objective is how do we handle this now? Where do we go from here? The second one is um, how do we provide for our defense? And the third is who's going to lead this effort, right? So the first point of where do we go from here, they have two diverging groups kind of, or groups of ideas. And the first one is they want to try to reconcile themselves with King George and Parliament, okay? And it is what is common in all rebellions against monarchy is that they don't actually attack the king as much they say that he's got bad advisors okay well uh americans don't buy that <laughs> they attack the king um and they say that he has done all of these things in the declaration of independence there's a list of grievances um and they're specifically talking about the king when in fact at this point in time it really is parliament but um so they have two differing ideas about it. So we're going to try and reconcile with the king. They realize that starting the war or going to war with the British is a monumental task that they might not be ready for. And they're not sure that everybody in the colonies is going to support that. So they come up with the Olive Branch Petition, which is a document that they um, send to the king and parliament in which they attempt to reconcile. Uh, they have grievances. They talk about um, conciliations, right? What they're going to do, how they're going to change. Um, but they want representation. And they also want taxes to be decided and levied by local governments. And so when they send that, they also have a plan B, right? And the plan B is the Declaration of Independence. So they set up this committee. And um, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson is one of the committee members, and their job is to draft uh, a Declaration of Independence. They decide they need this document because of what they're doing, right? Basically, they're rebelling against the largest empire in the world, and they want everyone to know why, right? And they're trying to establish legitimacy. <clears throat> Excuse by <clears throat> laying out what they consider lawful legal um, points of contention. In other words, reasons why they're leaving. And <clears throat> um, so they're waiting. They, they want the committee to draft a document, but they're hoping that they don't need it, right? And then they move on to how do they provide for the common defense until either the Olive Branch petition is accepted or the Declaration of Independence is needed. Okay. And they create the Continental Army and they vote and elect 
George Washington as his leader, its commander in chief. Um, he's, he's from Virginia, first of all, so it's important that he's a southerner. Um, the, the issues that uh, New England is having is that while Boston seems to be the hotbed of rebellion, uh, they need to make sure that the southern colonies are with them because they cannot fight a war by themselves. They have to have the other 12 colonies with them or else they're definitely going to lose, right? So they choose a Virginian, a southerner, in hopes that that will also bring in <clears throat> southern support. He's well known. He's well respected. Um, he is a planter. He's he has slaves. He um, inherited Mount Vernon, which is a large plantation, and he has the most experience in the British Army because he served in the French and Indian War, and um, he was an officer in the British Army before that. And his job there was a cartographer, which means he makes maps. So he's very um, well versed in the geography of the region, which is another kind of plus in his in his favor. Um, and he accepts the position and begins attempting to raise funds because how do we go to war with no money? Right. Unfortunately, this is a problem that will plague him the entirety of the war. They will never have enough money for the army. Right. And they have to rely on donations and a lot of the upfront money is provided by private citizens such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, right? They put in their own money, Benjamin Franklin, to help outfit and feed these troops. So um, you have voluntary contributions by the states. <clears throat> uh, the colonies are calling themselves states now. Uh, but again, as we know about voluntary contributions or donations, it doesn't always come up to um, how much you actually need to do this. So money is going to consistently be a problem. And um, the Olive Branch petition get, uh, is rejected right, in large part by the king, by the crown, and by parliament. So let's pull this up. And I'll show you the document, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, meanwhile, two things happen, right? They're meeting in 1775 into 1776. Um, <clears throat> there is a large slave revolt in Jamaica during this time. And that's important for two reasons. Number one, it continues to breed fear amongst the Southerners that slaves will revolt. Number two, it diverts England's attention or the British attention to Jamaica, because as we said before, Jamaica makes more money for them than any of the other 13 combined, including Canada. Even if you had Canada in there, Jamaica still makes more money for the British. So they are desperate to protect Jamaica. They are also desperate to keep their planters in control. And in Jamaica, as in many islands in the Caribbean, the African-American population, or it's not American, but the um, enslaved people of African descent outnumber the Europeans or the slave owners by something like five to one in population, right? So it's very important for the British to go down there and try and put down the slave revolt, which they are somewhat successful. Um, there's a large maroon community that develops in on the island and maroons are runaway slaves and they control the mountains, the mountainous regions. Um, they are infamous, right, in the area, highly successful in protecting themselves and um, bringing violence when needed. They enable other slaves to run away. So it's an interesting and, and very fascinating community that they create for themselves and they're called maroons but so this is all going on in jamaica so how does that right we said because the british are going to divert their attention in addition to that you have a guy named lord dunmore and he is in virginia and uh, he's been put there by the crown right he's a um he's given a landed estate he's a slaveholder and he issues something called Lord Dunmore's Proclamation. Lord Dunmore's Proclamation states that 
um, if enslaved people run away from patriots plantations or enslavement by patriots and join the British cause, they will earn their freedom. Okay, so this is this is tricky, right? Because it doesn't say that all enslaved people who join the cause are going to earn their freedom, right? It says that if you are running away from a patriot master or owner, you will earn your freedom. And so if a loyalist is your master, no deal, doesn't apply to you. Um, and if you are enslaved by an officer or um, a British uh, government official, also doesn't apply to you. OK, but his goal in this is to scare the southern plantation owners into staying loyal to the crown. OK, and it backfires in spectacular fashion because this signals to plantation owners in the south that the British are going to free their enslaved people. And this is very scary for them. All right. Um, so instead of keeping the South out of the war, which is what Dunmore wanted, it really draws them in and solidifies their alliance with New England. So now the South has just as much to lose in their mind as New England does. Um, so this is why when we come into the Declaration of Independence, you have widespread support through all 13 colonies, at least amongst the representatives. Um, there's going to be two Groups of people, when we talk about loyalists, we're talking about people who stay loyal to the British crown and the British government. When we talk about patriots, we're talking about those who are in open rebellion against the British government and the British crown. And they are what we would call Americans, right? American statesmen. So um, in the beginning of July, Thomas Jefferson presents his first draft of the Declaration of Independence. And like most group work, Right. He does most of the work. One person does all the work. Um, so he brings this document um, to the Congressional Congress. And at this point, um, everything has to be done in secret because after the Olive Branch petition, the British crowd said you cannot meet uh, without a British officer there. OK, so they're meeting in secret in July in just terribly hot clothing. Right. They wore a lot more clothing than we wear today um, in this uh, town hall in Philadelphia with those clothes, right? Exceptionally hot um, and humid. And they're discussing this document. OK. And the representatives want a whole bunch of edits to it, to the first draft. The person is not pleased by this, but he agrees to make the edits and we get the official Declaration of Independence. And again, issued in Congress in July 4, 1776. It's actually signed, I want to say, like on the 2nd, but it's read out to the public on the 4th. And it's read through all 13 uh, states. They'll call themselves states now. And here's some of your famous lines, right? Laws of nature, um, unalienable rights certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Very famous quotes here. Uh, glaring hypocrisy, right? Because, hello, there's millions of enslaved people that apparently don't count. Um, but, again, we'll get to that later. Um, and so the first is they're talking about what uh, this is about. Uh, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve political bands with another. Okay, so we have to leave, and here's why. Okay, so some people call this the uh, most famous breakup letter ever. Um, and so um, he goes on to say, he goes on to state why they're leaving. And the he in all of these, the beginning of all these sentences is King George III. Right. He has refused to assent to laws. He's forbidden governors to pass laws, refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts. He's called together legislative bodies at unusual, uncomfortable and distant places, dissolved representative houses, um, 
refuse to elect other representatives, prevent the population of these states um, for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the concerns of new appropriation of lands. In other words, uh, restricting the ability for immigrants to become citizens right, of, at that time, the British Empire. Something we are still arguing about today, right? Obstructed administration of justice, et cetera, et cetera, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Um, so these are all the lists. This is basically a long list of done me wrongs, like what the king and government has done wrong. And then at the bottom, right, we therefore the representatives of the United States of America uh, solemnly publish and declare that we are free and independent states and dissolve all of our allegiance to the British crown. All right, so this is big. This is the first time you've seen something like this. And actually, several countries will copy this. The French will copy it in about 10 years with the Declaration of Rights and Citizens. The Vietnamese will copy it in the 1950s. Um, so the Declaration of Independence is kind of a monumental document in world history, too. And then, of course, the key is that they signed it. Um, signatures, right, often overlooked, but equally important, in my opinion, because it shows you that at this point, they realized that this was the point of no return. Once you put your name on this document, you're in it to win it or you're going to die. Right. And the reason for that is that the punishment for treason is um, hanged, drawn and quartered which we'll go into what that is in a minute. But um, anybody who signs this document identifies themselves as a traitor to the English crown and the English government. So essentially, by signing it, they are giving the king a list of traitors. And uh, that's how he sees it. And he creates and signs all of the death warrants for everyone who signed the Declaration of Independence. He gives um, his dragoons special instructions when they come over to suppress, quote, suppress this revolt, um, that if they are to find, if they find any of these people, they are to be transferred back to London and made examples of. Okay, so pretty big um, commitment they're making here. They also sign it so that people, uh, populations in all the 13 colonies can see that all of the representatives signed it. Um, that we are in this war together, right? It's not just Massachusetts. We're all in it. Um, so, and it's after this point when Benjamin Franklin issues his famous um, line of, gentlemen, we must all hang together or we will surely hang separately. Um, and so a traitor's death or a traitor's punishment is exceptionally brutal. And it is meant as a, I'm trying to find John Hancock's here. Uh, deterrent, right, to uh, anyone, anyone else. So when you're hung and quartered, you are hung, but not to uh, break your neck. They hang you to strangle you. While you're still alive, they'll cut you down. Then they will lay you out. And again, all of this is done very publicly. Um, cut you open on your uh, abdomen. Remove all of your insides. Uh, while you're still alive, castrate you if you're male, and then um, finally kill you by cutting out your heart and showing it uh, to the population, to the populace. Then they will cut your body up into quarters, uh, limbs, head, etc., and send you to separate parts of the realm. Um, so this is what it means to be drawn and quartered. It's brutal. It's medieval. Uh, it's effective, right? Because um, treason is such a, a huge chance to take, okay? Um, and so that's what this is, kind of their signatures is such a big deal. And by doing this, you're also depriving a uh, person's family of any kind of Christian burial. They can't be buried in a cemetery um, and they don't actually get your body back, right? So it's a huge deal. In addition, right, we talk about John Hancock right here. And very famous, right, 
and when people say put your John Hancock on there, they mean put your signature. He puts his signature right in the middle, right at the top of the signature part um, in big, huge letters. Everyone can read it. And when asked about why he did this, he said, well, I wanted to make sure that they spelled my name right on my death warrant. So uh, they knew. They knew what they were doing. Okay. Um, and so that's why this is such a historical document, but also a document of such gravity. Right. So they've declared their independence. We've got George Washington as commander in chief of the military. We've created the Continental Army. And you start to see militias forming in uh, the different colonies, the different states. I'm sorry. So they call up these militias that they had from the French and Indian War. And they do have a lot of volunteers. But the way they work um, is that they sign up for a year and the end of the actual physical year, right, New Year's. They have the option to either re-enlist or go home. Okay, so again, it's all volunteer. It's based on volunteers. Um, so they're not drafting anybody yet. Um, and that's going to become a problem for Washington soon. Okay, so following the Declaration of Independence and really uh, before that, the British begin mobilizing large numbers of troops and their navy. And um, Boston is already under siege. Unfortunately, though, after Lexington and Concord and the Battle of um, Bunker Hill, they realize they can't hold Boston. So they abandon Boston, but they focus on New York. And the British take over the port of New York. Uh, they send in just huge amounts of ships and troops through the British Navy, and they control New York City. There is a battle there called the Battle of Brooklyn in which um, Washington attempts to get them out of New York City, and that is an utter failure. He has to basically run away in the middle of the night through an old Native American trail um, back into New Jersey. So, and this happens around October of 1776. And he regroups in New Jersey, but he's in a bad way, Washington is. He needs money. He needs a win. And um, he's seeing basically massive desertion at the end of the year. Okay. So he comes up with this strategy about Trenton and uh, Princeton. Now, Great Britain is owed money by the German republics. And in lieu of paying that debt, they send 30,000 Hessian soldiers from the area of Hesse, right? So they're called Hessian soldiers. And they are mercenaries, basically, hired guns. They're, um, they've seen combat, they're battle-hardened, they are career soldiers, and they're good at what they do. And they're stationed in New Jersey, in the towns of Princeton and Trenton. So Washington, understanding that there is... Um, very little option for him in the way of fighting the British in an open field. Okay, so when we look at the job that he has before, he's got to win a war against the largest empire in the world. So he realizes that uh, he has several weaknesses, right? He has no navy. He does not have um, a standing army that the British do. The people that he does have are volunteers, they're farmers, they're lawyers, they're people that have regular jobs that have volunteered to do this. Um, he doesn't have money for food, he doesn't have money to clothe them, um, he doesn't have you know, a lot of resources, and he certainly cannot go head to head with a full British army. Uh, and he realizes that quickly. So what do you do in a situation like that? You change the rules of the game, okay? And again, in British warfare during the 18th century, right, they would have one army on one side of a field and another army on the other side of the field, and they would just stand there and shoot at each other, okay? And they use artillery, right, cannons, uh, et cetera. We also have a shortage of those. Um, we do have some, but we have we don't have as many as the British do. So Washington says, all right, well, we're not going to fight that way. Can't win that way. 
Okay, so what advantages does do the Americans have? Um, first off, they all live there, so they know the geography of the region very well. Second off, they're a lot better shot than the British. They have better guns. Most of them are their own, right? They use them for hunting, so you become a better shot when your dinner's on the line, right? <laughs> um, so they're better shot. They have at more accurate weapons. They know the territory. They know the terrain. And there's a lot more at stake for those fighting for the Americans because for them, it's life or death. For the British soldiers, this is just another uh, battle they have to fight for the king. They've been doing this for a long time, right? So this is not anything new to them, and they don't have a lot of vested interest in this. And a lot of British soldiers have a hard time with this because these are British citizens. They've never been called upon to go to war with other British citizens before. So these are kind of the pluses, you know, the pros and cons on both sides. Washington needs a win. He says, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to do a sneak attack. We're going to do a surprise attack on after Christmas, right? And why the day after Christmas? Well, just like people today, what do you do on Christmas? You get together with your family or your friends, you exchange gifts, you eat too much, and you drink a lot, right? Now, people of the 18th century, their tolerance for alcohol would put us to shame. I don't care how much you drink. They drink more war on a regular basis every day they were drinking because at the time ale beer and wine were safer to drink than water because they had no way to uh, sterilize the water so the alcohol in the other uh, liquids would keep them from getting sick so these people were probably already borderline alcoholics on a day-to-day -day basis and then you add in christmas and the fact that uh, Trenton and Princeton are controlled by the Germans who are, have a reputation, right, for liking their drink. And he attacks on uh, the morning of the 26th, it, very early in the morning. It's one of his famous, there's a famous painting, right, of George Washington leading his troops across the River Delaware in boats. And he attacks Trenton. Uh, resounding victory. Half the Hessians are still passed out. The other half are probably still drunk and or hungover. Uh, the, town's, the town also is still asleep. So it's a quick, decisive victory um, the day after Christmas, right? And the, the Hessians don't even really know what hit them by the time it's all over. So Washington's got his win. And it's it almost blows him how easy it was. So he decides to do it again at Princeton. And this time he does it over New Year's. Okay, so two decisive victories back to back within a two week time frame and soldiers stay, morale improves, they get more funding from Congress. Um, and so this is kind of a big plus in their in their direction. Um, but following that, right, it's winter and normally during European um, you make camp in the winter. There's not a lot of fighting in the winter. The weather just doesn't permit it. So for the first time, Washington, first and only time, by the way, decides to make winter camp at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Um, and so he has recruits that are coming and going because, right, it's the change of the year. Um, it is winter, and it is one of the br most brutally cold winters that they've heard of here. So um, people don't have enough things to wear. They don't have enough food. Again, money is a constant problem from Congress. They just cannot get enough. Um, and so things are not going well. And when large groups of people who are, you know, in one place don't have enough to eat, don't have enough clothes to wear, their immunity is decreased, um, there's not, you know, hygiene, nobody's taking a shower. Um, so uh, you have disease that starts to take hold, particularly smallpox. And enter a guy named Wilhelm von Steuben. Steuben is a Prussian, which is based like an Eastern German. Um, Prussia is like Eastern Germany and Poland today. And he comes to North America to join the revolution, as does Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton comes to go to college at King's College, but is then the war breaks out and he joins the Continental Army. 
and eventually works his way up to become quartermaster and pretty good friend with George Washington. But Steuben comes and provides a lot of resources to him, to Washington, in particular his experience and his technology. Uh, why does Steuben leave? Why does he come here? Uh, he is well regarded as a military tactician and leader, but it's also rumored that he's homosexual. And there was a lot of um, press going on at the time that he was having a relationship with one of his subordinates. At the time, right, this could ruin your career in the military, um, and it could even land you in jail for, uh, for this problem. So he leaves ahead of that. Um, and to be fair, the army allows it and gives him full honors, you know, an honorable discharge. And he comes to the United States, joins the American Revolution. What he says when he finds George Washington at Valley Forge is basically, you're doing this all wrong. <laughs> he says, you've moved the kitchen, the mess hall, away from the latrine, which is where you go to the bathroom. He's like, these two cannot be that close together, right? Moves them to opposite sides of the camp. Says you have to be training these guys every single day. They need to be up doing something every single day, right? As I say, idle time or uh, idle hands at the girls' playground. He's like, you are just allowing them to get more depressed and grumble amongst each other if they don't have something to do. In addition to having something to do, it keeps them warm. So he gets some training every day. He he reorganizes the camp. He he makes uh, people that are in the same units bunk together and commanders have uh, close to their units in which they command, okay? And this increases morale amongst the camp there. He also brings with him the idea of inoculation. Inoculation is a uh, early rudimentary form of vaccination. And let me um, show you real quick, I'm sorry. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, a picture of smallpox, okay? Just warning you, this is gonna be graphic. Um, okay, so obviously these are extreme cases, but um, they make these like pus-filled pockets on your skin, okay? And the way to inoculate against that is um, it doesn't always come on this severe these are the most severe cases is he says um, you what you do is you open you cut a small make a small cut usually in the upper arm of the person who's going to be inoculated right so a little bit of blood starts coming out and then you take some of that pus from one of those smallpox victims and stick it on that cut so what you're doing is you are introducing live virus to a healthy person in such a small amount that their body will now be able to build up its own immunity and antibodies to it. And by doing this, pretty much saves hundreds, if not thousands of lives in uh, the revolutionary, the Continental Congress. Also, that you start to see this go through Boston. Boston is having a, small, a hard time with smallpox too, and people start inoculating themselves there. So this is all part of the kind of technology that he brings with him, uh, military experience and know-how. Um, where are we? Here we go. Oh, if you can see it. All right. Um, meanwhile, right back at the ranch, uh, Congress is lobbying other empires for support. They're trying to money they're trying to borrow weapons they're trying to borrow any kind of resources that they can get their hands on the biggest problem is that they don't have a navy okay uh brianna isn't that almost how vaccines are today yes um but they give it to you in a shot um and most of the times you don't get live virus you get dead virus um, because there is an inherent risk when you introduce live virus that you're actually giving somebody smallpox um, and that does happen, but it was like a rare, like 3% of the people who got that actually got smallpox. Um, so it's kind of like you get your flu shot today, you're getting dead virus, and your body builds up an immunity to that. Um, and are there reactions to the flu shots? Yes, right? They're a small percentage, but it does happen. 
So the big difference is you're getting live virus versus dead virus. Okay. Um, but in theory, it's the same, right? It's the same theory. Introduce a small portion of the virus to build up natural immunity. Okay, so we're lobbying the French because uh, the French have the Navy, the French hate the British, and um, the Spanish do too. But the French are, have more to offer right now. Um, but what the French says, we got to see some indication that you can win because we don't want to lose another war to the British, right? And of course, the British are threatening to do that. So the Battle of Saratoga in October of 1777 is very important because of the win at Saratoga, the French agree to support the American cause. Okay. And again, Saratoga is um, not only a victory, but they use guerrilla warfare. They don't stand up in lines and march against the troops. Um, oftentimes they try to pick out the captains, right? They go for the leadership first, which is against all in, you know, British or European warfare standards. Um, so you pick out the guys with the fancy hats um, because those are the captains, lieutenants, generals, etc. And so by going after them first, you create a disarray amongst the troops. And again, this is a new way of fighting a war. So the English troops are a little lost by all of this. And again, like I said, guerrilla tactics. You put snipers in trees. You... Um, shoot at them and run away, and then ambush them in other places. So all of these are kind of characteristics of what goes on in Saratoga. And <clears throat> based on the win there, the French agree to support them. Burgoyne is in Canada. He's a British general. He hoped to meet up with Howe, um, General Howe, who's in New York. But um, General Gates defeats them. And what the British plan of action is, is to basically take the troops from Canada and the troops from New York, squish the New England states, and then combine forces and move south and pick these states off one by one. Unfortunately, that never works. They're never able to combine Canada with New York. Um, and then Cornwallis in the south has some victories, but he's never able to combine with the other two portions of the British army. Um, so this doesn't ever materialize for them. So the French, um, again, began mobilizing to send support. They officially signed, it, signed a treaty in 1778, making their support of the American cause known to the world. Um, Spain comes in to support the French. So they send money, but Spain doesn't send any troops. Okay, They're kind of a silent partner in all of this. And two huge things come out that benefit the American colonists. One, the French send their Navy and start engaging in naval warfare to release the blockade that the British have put on the states. Um, when the British Navy blockades the 13 states, they're unable to get any kind of relief or resources to purchase and to bring into the war effort. So the French Navy um, helps provide relief in that respect. Um, the Spanish and the French also open up other theaters of war, meaning they start wars with the British in other places, such as in Holland. Uh, the Spanish control what they call the Low Countries there. And so they open up war, a uh, theater of war in Holland. They also, um, along with the French, open up theaters of war in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, in India, in the Caribbean. So the British are forced to divide their their troops and divide their navy. So it's kind of one of those divide and conquer strategies, right? And because they have to divert all these resources, again, to protecting Jamaica and their colonies in Africa and their colonies in Britain, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Mediterranean, that means there's less pressure on the American states. Um, so all this is very, very beneficial to um, <clears throat> the war effort. So the war in the South, uh, the British are can pick off the cities pretty easily. Um, they can control the cities and the ports relatively easily, especially at the beginning of the war, before the French come in. Um, but they can't control the countryside. They can't control um, the back country, especially. So um, you have the American General Francis Marion, who they nickname the Swamp Fox. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have generals. 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, Green and Morgan, who um, effectively kicked Cornwallis out of South Carolina. Cornwallis is the British commander. And Cornwallis is forced into Yorktown, Virginia for the winter of, uh, we'll say, 1780. The famous French uh, Navy admiral that brings his navy in um, and does just wonders as far as engaging the British Navy is Admiral Paul de Grasse. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette and Comte de Rochambeau are two uh, famous generals of the French that come in with large numbers of troops to help relieve and provide needed, much needed support and resources to the American side. And uh, Lafayette will stay. Uh, he will write a lot of um, good history about what happened in these early years. And if you've watched uh, Alexander Hamilton, the the show, um, he's integral, right, in that. Um, and combined, they forced Cornwallis to surrender in October of 1781. Uh, in 1780, Cornwallis is begging Burgoyne and Howe to send him troops, to send him reinforcements. He's begging the British Navy to help him out. Nobody can get to him. Washington and his troops have managed to keep these three arms of the British military separate. Um, they can never combine forces. The Navy is engaged in naval warfare with the French, is being diverted to other parts of the world, so they cannot come in and rescue Cornwallis. He's trapped, and he um, is forced to surrender in 1781 and this effectively ends the fighting so the fighting ends in 1781 but we don't have an official treaty until 1783 okay and the treaty of paris of 1783 establishes american independence so we're now officially the united states okay uh we won the war it draws the line uh the border between the u.s and canada it provides American fishing rights off of Newfoundland, which is a province of Canada, so we can fish in the North Atlantic free of harassment from British and Canadian uh, troops. And it's important in this aspect to remember the date. Um, I'm not big on making everybody remember a bunch of dates, but there are some that are pretty important. And if you're going to take, say, the final exam and they're talking about the Treaty of Paris, there are two that we've had already. Um, the first one is the end of the French and Indian War, and that's the Treaty of Paris of 1763. And then there's this one, which is the end of the American Revolution, and this is the Treaty of Paris of 1783. Right? So it's just beginning, you know, it's just important to know the difference between the two, two different wars. So then the question is, well, now what? Right? And they uh, 1777, the, the Continental Congress is already working on a form of government, right? And so for the first time, the people and their representatives are allowed to create a government from scratch. And so they take a lot of what they like from the British and what they like from other forms of government, including the Roman Empire, and leave the rest, okay? And they their idea is that they're going to create this confederation of states so they don't fully ratify the articles confederation until they win the war 1781 and again it says a firm league of friendship so that is not binding right not very um, secure in their relationship with each other exactly what does that mean a league of friendship um, in the real world not a whole lot apparently so each state, each state will retain its sovereignty. In other words, Virginia makes laws for Virginians, uh, New Hampshire for New Hampshire people, right? They cannot tax. There cannot be a national tax. All taxes have to be dealt with locally. They cannot form an army. So this kind of disbands the Continental Army. They rely on voluntary contributions from each state to pay off this war debt. And they have created quite a bit of war debt. Okay. And any decision passed by the Articles of Confederation or this Congress has to be agreed upon by everyone. 100% agreement. 
So it has problems because nobody can agree 100%. Right? Could you imagine if we had, if we still had that today? Congress had to agree 100% before any laws were passed. We'd never get anything. We hardly get anything out of them now, but we'd never get anything out of them. Right? So this is what's set up. Um, what was the impact of these other uh, African Americans, women, and Native Americans? In large part, the African Americans joined the British uh, as uh, runaway slaves or free blacks, um, mostly because there's an opportunity for freedom there. And the British government is already looking at abolition seriously. They have abolition groups already um, arguing for abolition of slavery and the international slave trade. And that's their biggest uh, point, is the international slave trade. Don't deal with uh, the issues of slavery later on. But right now they're focused on outlawing the slave trade. Um, and so African Americans see this as who they should side with, as you can imagine. Unfortunately, uh, they don't win. So... Um, if they're lucky, they leave with the British when the British evacuate. If not, they're re-enslaved and oftentimes um, sold to the Caribbean because they don't want, the Patriots don't want, quote-unquote, traitors in their midst. Uh, Vermont, in its state constitution, each state writes its own constitution. Uh, they outlaw slavery. Pennsylvania and New York do as well. So you already see New England is moving towards abolition. Okay. Many Native Americans side with the British um, in their support for the proclamation of 1763 because the British were actually keeping the colonists out of the backcountry where the Native Americans were, and they, Native Americans were tired of siding with what they considered the losing side of wars, hence the French and Indian War, right? So they stuck with the biggest empire, hedging their bets that they would win, uh, but they didn't. And um, then you have uh, New Jersey puts in its constitution that women are allowed the right to vote. Right, so very early on, you have Abigail Adams, who's lobbying her husband John Adams to include women's suffrage, that's women's right to vote, in Massachusetts constitution. Uh, and her famous Don't Forget the Ladies was in a letter that she wrote to him. They wrote back and forth proliferously during uh, the war, and most of them have been saved. So um, they're say she's saying, you know, women's suffrage is important. Unfortunately, he's unable to get that through Massachusetts uh, Congress. But um, there is the argument there. Then you have uh, the murder of Jane McCrae in New York. Uh, the Mohawks are a Native American tribe that lead a raid into New York State, upper New York State, and they murder a family, particularly the McCrae family. And uh, when the family is found, everyone, including the women and children, I, mean, I don't think the children, I think the children were kidnapped, uh, but the men and women were murdered. And um, Jane McCrae was scalped, which is not unusual for the time. Um, and if you don't know what that means, it basically means they cut a piece of her hair, um, a piece of the skin off her scalp that had hair on it right um after she was dead of course and um so this is kind of brutal but also propaganda i mean it's widely spread throughout the 13 states um, to stir up discrimination against native americans and so um they don't fare very well after the war um and camp followers. So camp followers on both sides, right? They are wives, mistresses, um, could be African Americans, could be Native Americans, although Native Americans not don't really tend to do that. Um, but these people, what happens to them after the war, right? And the wives do go back um, with their husbands. But uh, what about these African Americans who have been loyally serving in the American Revolution? Some of them are granted their freedom. Some of them are re-enslaved, right? Sent back to their masters, or they were fighting alongside them. 
Um, and so on the side of the British, anybody who is a camp follower has to leave with them. If they don't, um, they are branded a loyalist, and that is going to be a very tricky situation because the colonists the, that are now Americans, patriots who have won the war, will exact violence against loyalists. They will burn their house down. They will kick them out. They will make them leave their country, um, sometimes with only the clothes they have on, sometimes in the middle of the night. They threaten to tar and feather people. They uh, threaten to hang people for treason. So loyalists that are left there have to leave, and most of them do. They go to Canada. So there's a large um, population in Newfoundland and also um, northern, uh, northeastern Canada of British loyalists. Okay, and then we have Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold is one of the interesting stories of the American Revolution. Uh, he was a British soldier that joined the side of the, uh, that was an American. And so when the revolution broke out, he joined the Continental Army. He was a good friend of George Washington um, and served well, especially in the Battle of Syracuse. And thus, Washington appointed him the command of what will become West Point. And that's along the border with Canada. And he's given this pretty big job, right? And his job is to patrol the border and make sure we don't see large numbers of British troops coming in from Canada. And he's pretty effective at that. But he has a large ego. And he feels as though he did not get enough credit for winning the Battle of Saratoga. So he's already um, disgruntled, should we say. And his wife is a loyalist and her family are wealthy loyalists. So she's constantly in his ear about joining the side of the British. And eventually um, he does. He meets with the British. They agree to pay him 30,000 pounds, uh, sterling pounds, which is like, you know, $30,000. But it was a lot of money back then, right, when the average um, yearly income was 1,000, 2,000 pounds, right? So... A lot of money. And he agrees to hand over all the plans for the northern strategy by the Continental Army. Um, but as fate would have it, Washington, and this is early in the war, uh, is in New York and decides to go see his friend Benedict and have breakfast with him, right? Or lunch, however it may be. And he takes Hamilton with him, Alexander Hamilton, who's quartermaster of the Continental Army by now. And off they go to see Benedict Arnold. Arnold hears that they're coming. Um, his scouts tell them that they're on the way. He freaks out, thinks they have to know that he's a traitor and is losing his mind, right? And his wife says, just go to Canada and they won't hurt a woman and I'll just pretend I'm hysterical, right? But they'll kill you if they find you. So he takes off and he goes to Canada, which is basically like across the river, <laughs> okay? And so Washington and all Hamilton show up. He goes, well, where is Benedict? You know, um, what's going on? And he starts to realize that Benedict is a traitor and has abandoned him. His wife, uh, Benedict Arnold's wife, is hysterical, right? She, it's, she's a good actress. Um, she didn't know what was going on, and he abandoned her and whatnot. Washington basically is like, okay, just stop you, yeah, right? Uh, and he's like, just go to Canada with your husband. He's devastated. And we see this in his journals and we see this in the things that he writes about what had happened. Uh, huge betrayal, personal as well as, um, you know, commandment, uh, a part of his, his command. And um, labels him as a traitor. So Benedict Arnold is in Canada with his wife. Uh, he's gotten his money. And he thinks that he's going to get like a commission in the British Army, that he's going to be able to continue fighting. But the British Army doesn't want anything to do with him. And their question is, why would we trust a traitor? Like, you just gave up your best friends. You just gave up your countrymen. What makes us think that you would stay on our side? We're not going to tell you anything. You don't get to be part of the army. Once a traitor, always a traitor. Right? So he is not given the reception that he thought he was going to be given. He's paid his 30,000 pounds and he lives in obscurity basically until his death, which is why you don't see a lot of Americans named Benedict. 
right? Um, and so his uh, legacy is widespread as a trader. Um, so that, we already covered that. Um, really concludes the war. Um, do you guys have any questions about that? Concerns? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll start the quote discussion. We'll start doing the polls. Okay. Um, stop sharing.